Hello, welcome to this special interview of the litmus test with sound mixer Peter Fenton. Hello, Peter. Hello. Now, Peter's been uh, a mixer in the film industry, Australian film industry, for decades. I mean, you're part of the, the establishment, basically. You go way back. And I am going to start way back with you. How did you get into this game? And, and when did you get into this game? Well, I started in radio. So I started in sound in 1953. I left school at uh, having done five years at Parramatta High School, Select High School. Did very poorly in my academic work, but played very good cricket, rugby, tennis and so on. And sport's been a major part of a your major life. A major part, it has. I love sport. I do yeah. love sport. Still love it. So I had a look in the, in the Herald for a jobs vacant thing and I found, come and work in TUE's presentation department. And I thought, that sounds pretty cushy, Radio TUE. So I went, and even though I'd done poorly academically, I was overqualified by a mile, and I got a job as a panel operator, which was playing records on the air. So how old were you here? Uh, 17, okay. maybe, maybe just turning 18. And this was in 19... Early, nine, this would be the middle of 1954. Okay. Yeah. Um, so panel operators in those days played everything on the radio that wasn't the announcer's voice. That may sound strange, but it's fact. You obviously the disc, the, the phonograph records, you know, Sonata and Nat King yep. Cole and those things, they were records. But so were the recorded commercials, recorded on a 78 revs per minute 10 inch uh, disc with three one minute tracks or six 30 second tracks of, of commercials. So were the themes you played. Uh, so were the, the serials. They were 16 inch transcriptions. Now that's about 40 centimetres, I think. They put everything in, on vinyl. Absolutely. Well, yes. In fact, some of the really old ones were the very heavy ones that were more like... The, 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 I forget yeah. what it's called, but yes. Ba the more like Bakelite. Whatever. Bakelite, yeah, yes. Sure. <laughs> so, and, and so were the sound effects records. So the announcer spoke, pointed to you, you're in a booth with six turntables, um, and you played everything else. And I did that for about 18 months or two years. I got quite good at that. So then they put me in the, in the production department, which was, in fact, making the serials that I'd been playing on the air. So you got a script, you chose your music from a music library, because there was music obviously specially recorded, like by Chapel and Boosie Hawks and Boosie and Hawks and those companies. So you chose your music and your little musical uh, themes, you know, little bridges and so on. And you, you chose all your sound effects, which were also still on record. Cars, buses, gunshots, trains, whatever. And you got them all ready and you went into the studio with the, with the producer and the actors in the studio and you set the mics up and the actors read their lines and you played everything else. And this is radio play. This was radio, like radio plays and radio serials. Yeah. And then in 1956, where I was just getting good at it, television happened and all the money dropped out of radio production and it all went to television because 56, as you know, was the, the, the Olympic year and that they, they put TV here to coincide with the Melbourne Olympics. That was, yeah. Correct. So suddenly, um, there was very little to do in radio production. And I got a phone call, I remember to this day, and a bloke said, your name, you're Peter Fenton? I said, I am. He said, my name's Merv Murphy. I said, hello, Mr. Murphy. I was now about 21 years of age. And he, oh, and, and he said to me, um, I want you to come and work for me. I said, how do you know? He said, I know what you do, and I know I want you to work for me. I want you to be a sound mixer in film. And I thought, film, you know, Judy Garland, you know, the, yes. I thought films Hollywood. Because if you'd grown up in the war years, as I did, born in 1936, the only films you saw were American, you know. The only thing Australia made was the Cinescope newsreels and correct, stuff. We didn't correct. really do movies. Correct, yeah. and an occasional um, uh, do a documentary made by the, um, I forget what they were called. Or Smiley Gets a Gun, all those sorts of things. Well, a little bit of that, right. <laughs> anyway, I thought films. I said, I don't know anything about it, you know, I'm not sure. He said, look, don't worry about it. I know what you do, you'd be fine at it. And I said to him, well, I'm undecided. He said, what do you earn, son? And he called me son. And mm. I, I found out later, he called everybody son, not the blokes at least. What do you earn, son? And I said, 18 pounds a week. Now, this is 1957, 58. So it's eight years before decimal currency. And he said to me, I'll pay you 25. Seven pounds increase on 18, I yeah. thought. <laughs> Sounds pretty good. He said, and after you've been here for a few months, and you learn a very little simple job called optical transfers, I'll pay you 30 pounds a week. So I thought, I'm in. So I went to this little company called Supreme Sound, right next to the old, the uh, women's hospital in Young Street, Paddington. Right. And 
uh, uh, what they did, they were making, they were a production house making television commercials. So I mixed television commercials for several, well, for three or four years, virtually non-stop. And while that may seem not such a big deal. Yeah, it sounded like you were about to get into the movie industry. <laughs> well, <laughs> but you sort of are, because in those days, a, little, a, a commercial was a little film, shot on 35 millimeter film, recorded on magnetic film, mixed up from magnetic film to magnetic film, uh, optical transfer done so that, that you made a negative of, of the soundtrack, and obviously they made a negative of the image, married them together, they had a laboratory, out came the movie. So, so this is, this, I want to talk a bit about the technology and how sure. it's developed as well. So here you're talking about the picture shot on film, the sound is shot on magnetic film, what's that? Correct. Well, it's, they used to call it magnetic tape, but it's actually, it is magnetic film. They call it sprocketed tape. It's, it's film that's coated with oxide to record on, as opposed to coated with what will record an image. This, cellulite. This records the, correct, this records the sound. But it all starts off as just a clear uh, cellu uh, celluloid film. Right. And then you coat it with, with this, as I say, the oxide, which is just like... Just like magnetic tape. Exactly, right. exactly. But it's got sprocket holes on the side, perforations. And it runs on a machine with sprockets, so it stays in sync with the with the with the image. But they're two very separate systems. Until, oh, oh my word, until you you actually photograph the soundtrack, and and it goes through a little galvanometer thing, and the light then flickers, and out it comes as a little black line on the edge of a clear piece of film. So you get a, a pictorial waveform. Correct. On the cellular. Gear. So correct. So that's the soundtrack, mm. and of course there's a there's an image negative. They're married in the laboratory, out it comes, and there's your picture. The picture's that side, the image, and down there's this black wiggly line. So you learned how to turn the, the magnetic into optical. Exactly. Onto the one cellular to get, strip. Yeah. To get 30 quid a week. <laughs> <laughs> but, but every film, every, every commercial was a little picture. It was done exactly as you'd shoot a film, except that it ran 60 seconds instead of 60 or mm -hmm. 120 minutes. So, and also, it was fantastic practice for, for actual film mixing, like later on, on the grounds that in the 60 seconds, you did as many moves as you made often in a three minute um, uh, segment in a movie. You opened the fader for the, for the theme to, to play, you faded it down at exactly the right phrase in the music for the guy to speak over the top of it, whatever he's selling, he's selling his soap or his cornflakes, and you went to perhaps uh, what they called 100% sound, which, we did, which is the normal thing that, that when you shoot a movie, that was the TV term was 100% sound, which is original dialogue. Yeah. So you mix that as well. So you equalised him a bit differently to what you equalised the announcer and so on. And at the end of the thing, you faded the music up at exactly the right thing and it went boom, boom. So you had, you're running this magnetic film, you've got three, four, five, six, maybe strips, tracks. Well, in those days, we only had three and a recorder. Three and then you're bouncing down to one. Correct, right. correct. So if you had too many, you pre-mixed some. So you might get three tracks which are backgrounds and you put them together, that sounds good, it's the city, blah, blah, you know, brrr, cars going past thing. You might make them three get into one, yep. that that became a track, uh, a little pre-mix. But you were doing exactly what you did if you, if you were shooting Gone With The Wind, except they were 30 second and 60 second ads. And as I say, you did a lot of work in that 30 uh, or 60 seconds because in those days, there was no noise reduction in any of the tracks. You didn't open the fader until you wanted something, because it, it, you, you got some noise. Because uh, even though it's on celluloid, magnetic tape, yeah. iron filings, sure. you get this tape hiss. And one, well, once yeah. you did a pre-mix, obviously the, that, that, um, that tape was running over the head all the time. So you didn't open it till you wanted it. Mm. So I did that for, oh, at Supreme Sound, I was there about two and a half years then went to another company that, that did similar things, but I recorded a lot of stuff as well. In those days, the, you weren't just the re-recording mixer. You, if, the, if we did a commercial on stage, you would go in and shoot the sound. Then it, it was recorded on magnetic film. And in fact, Australia actually split the film from 35 mil to 17 and a half mil. So it ran through a machine with the sprockets on just one side, which was a little bit wobbly. Hmm. It wasn't as good. It was good when it worked beautifully, but it would it could fall off a bit. Why do that to, to double the pure money, pure yeah. pure economics? You bought a roll of thirty-five millimeter sound, 
Split it in two and you had two rolls of sound. Yeah. Pure economics. What was the machine like that you were recording on location with for that? Well, they were, it was a machine that would have been as big as, uh, say, uh, oh, big as a washing machine, if you like. B- bit thinner, not as deep. And the, the, the sound, would, the, the track would run down. There were a couple of stabilizers here and it would run over the heads. The thing about speed, that old thing about speed, Sound started speed, with them. Yeah. It start, and that was called by the recordist when the stabilizers had stabilized. So when you started it, the machine went, the stabilizer went, rum, 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 rum. The camera's rolling, and they'd say, camera, action, thing, thing. The sound, the camera goes, speed, and you'd have to wait. And I'd look at this, and when it was like that, I'd say, speed, and then you could start. So it was recorded on a little roll, 500 foot long, which is about, about as big as that that wide, 17 and a half mil. And, and at the end of three or four takes, you reloaded that, yeah. because obviously you'd done them all, you'd, you'd used that up. At United Sound, oh sorry, at Supreme Sound, they had a, mag, they had a, a, a it was called an Aracord, I think, an Aracord. And it actually had a camera, a big 35 mil camera, that had the sound in, in the camera as well, like magnetic, mag- oh, yeah. yeah, on the side of the camera, as part of the camera. So it's two I think separate it's mechanisms a running yes. at once. Yeah, and and we recorded um, some stuff on that, but generally it was on this old. It was a Smith and Cross, I think, which was a famous <laughs> name then. Arthur Smith, actually Arthur Carrington Smith, was the first guy to record optical sound in Australia, and he was there at Supreme when I was there. He was must have been seventy years of age then, and he was working there in the sound department, maintaining the gear, looking after things, and here was his. Smith and Cross recorder that they'd invented, they'd done. Mate. So this was running at 24 frames, the same as the film? 24 Picture frames, film? that's right. And TV, of course, was 25 frames. Yeah. So when you did a film or a commercial, it went up in pitch very slightly mm. when it went to, to um, on air. At least for Australia. In America, it's a whole sure. other kettle of fish. Exactly. <laughs> but out here, out here it, it did. And, and, and also, if you, if, you shot a, if you recorded a documentary, we made some documentaries there, when they went on TV, they used to sound a little bit like yeah, up here a bit. Yeah. But you'd have to be aware. You'd have to be trained to be aware of it. It wasn't. It wasn't very great. Anyway, I did this thing, and then I went to another studio in Bly Street in Sydney called Natec, and we recorded some music there as well. So I got a, a, um, education at recording music, which went straight to one track on a quarter-inch tape. So playing live through live. a single mic or multiple mics? Oh, multiple mics. Into yeah. a single mono track. Correct, yeah. correct. And we did a lot of radio and TV jingles there. And the jazz players, Don Burrows, um, um, George Goller, um, Johnny Sangster, those guys who were very good jazz players, mm. were the best sight readers. So they would come in at nine o'clock for a session. In an hour and a half, they'd lay down three or four background tracks and at half past ten, the singers would come in. Um, there were a bunch called the Park, uh, Parker Girls. Um, Alan Dean was a good vocalist. They'd come in and, and you'd then play the track you'd made. It was a, was a single track, quarter inch tape. You'd play that in through the earphones. They'd sing for another quarter inch tape and you had your TV or and radio jingle. And you just jingle. record it live and bounce it to another track, would absolutely, you? Right. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, you never ever had the singer on his own. <laughs> he was always with the band. Yeah. But yet you did have the, the, the non-vocal track, which they could come in in six months' time and change the words a bit. So this is going from radio yeah. to television, TV advertising yes. for many years. How yes. did this lead ultimately to yeah. more longer form drama and feature films? Okay. My third job was out of our Transa Park TV, which was out at uh, French's Forest, where the old blinking light was in those days. It was a great um, uh, landmark at Sydney. And they had built a Transa, which was owned by the same people as, as owned 2GB and Channel 7. They had built these marvellous studios, big high roof studios with big gantries, a la Hollywood, to shoot um, TV um, series. They had two very big uh, studios, two big sound stages and a mixing studio. So I went out there and even again, though most of your work were commercials, I went there, uh, I got a good rise to go there because the guy who was the chief of, of uh, radio and TV for Jackson Wayne Advertising, a fellow called Neville Merchant, who'd been my first boss at TV, got me a good job out there at Good Money, so I went there. Again, it was mainly TV commercials, but we did make some TV um, series. 
Such as? Uh, I mixed a big series there called Riptide that had Thai Harden in it. Yep. 26 one hour amps shot on 35 mil colour. They cost 100 grand an amp. In those days, this was about 1968. That was enormous money. Hmm. They didn't, I'm sure they wouldn't get their money back. But you could make a feature film for that sort of money. At that time, you could. Yeah. You could. 